Perfect. Now I have your number. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. Welcome back to the show. I know that you guys listening are always trying to be men who are more on purpose. And if you see our guest t-shirt, you can model that for a second there, Ian. (laughs) His shirt is Men on Purpose, and it's the host of the Men on Purpose podcast, Ian Lobos. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks, dude. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And um, purpose is something... I talk about a lot on this show and, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there around finding your purpose or what's your purpose. A lot of guys I talk to got kind of hung up on it. They don't know their purpose and they feel like they're fucked because of that or because of this. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of guys out there, not guys, I think there's a lot of people out there kind of um, preaching about, you got to know your purpose and blah, 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 blah. But I read a great book back in the day, David Data, The Way is the Superior Man. Yeah. Love it. And uh, he was like, your purpose could be finding your purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, who fucking cares? You'll figure it out. (laughs) Do the shit you need to do. Get shit done. Right. Don't be a lazy piece of shit. Uh, And um, well said. Yeah. I think during this time, um, you know, with all this shit going on, hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, you've been taking advantage and figuring out what the hell you're doing and doing a bunch of stuff instead of a lot of people who've probably been, you know, jerking off or doing other shit Sit around. Yeah. Yeah. Using, using COVID as an excuse to not do anything. So right. <laughs> hopefully I've alienated everyone, all my listeners with that spiel, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyways, so tell us your story. How'd you, um, how'd you kind of become the awesome dude that you are? And uh, you've got a, beautiful family and a great business to get to do what you love. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, first thing I want to start with is your, as you're describing purpose for the listeners is, you know, a lot of people in our coaching business, they come to me, especially now that I I have this podcast and it's doing so well and it's heard by a lot of people is that they go, well, I'm looking for my purpose and I make a correction. I make a course correction with them right there, which is, in my definition, in my understanding of it, as a person that has been a coach for a long time, helping men and women from all over the world, all economic and socioeconomic levels, um, I like to break down mission and purpose into two different categories. So first of all, your mission is what the world looks like when you've accomplished the mission. And I think that's a really good place to start because you can segment these things out. So your mission is what the world looks like when you're done and not when you're dead, because your mission could be a month, a day, a lifetime. It doesn't matter. So what does the world look like when you've accomplished your mission, right? If you take it in military terms, I like that. you know what the mission accomplishment looks like and you know what a mission fail looks like, right? Mm-hmm. And then break it down even farther to purpose. You know, in, in my early days in real estate sales and, and, and building my team and building my business, people used to say like, you know, don't make real estate your purpose, make your family your purpose. And I just didn't like that. It didn't register with me. So in my coaching program, I define purpose as who you are on the mission, right? The person that you become, the person that you're, that you're being, not doing, not the things you do, but the person that you are. So those words that you can describe like you in your purpose or on your purpose is, is, um, you know, happy, compassionate, kind. That's how you figure out this is my purpose. This is who I am on the mission. And then you define your mission. And then obviously the top of that is, you know, I have an exercise we use it at our, at our live events called VMP, vision, vision, mission, purpose. And you cast your vision as to what you see as possible in the world. Then you've got your mission as to what the world looks like when you're done. Then you've got your purpose, which is who you are on the mission. And that separates things so well. And then you just reverse engineer it if you want. Start by describing who you want to be, then work your way up. And and that VMP exercise is so clear in 30 minutes, 
versus having this this chase and this like grind of oh, I got to find my purpose on the planet. I got to find my like just do that. The vision is how you see the world, like what you see as possible in the world for yourself and the world and other people in it. The mission is what it looks like when you're done, what the world looks like when you're done. And the purpose is who you are on the mission. That's it. I love that. Podcast very over. Clear. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> very concise and very yeah. actionable, which is what I'm all about. Super actionable. Yeah. Super actionable. Yep. That's a really so cool my question. story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know where to start, dude. <laughs> I, you know, look, I, 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 uh, I grew up in a household. My dad was an entrepreneur and we, you know, my dad started a shipping company when I was four years old and, um, and I watched my dad and I was literally with my dad every day, every weekend as he built this business. So that's all I've really known. And my insecurity was I have to become an entrepreneur or I really won't live up to my dad's standards. And my dad never pushed me on that ever. He always told me to choose my path always. And if it was with him and his business, great. And if it wasn't, it wasn't. And he was, he was cool with that. And he loved me and supported me anyway. And I, I know a lot of uh, parents that push their kids, whether it's in business or in sports or push them to get a certain degree in college. As a parent, I can tell you that is so dangerous because you are pushing, you're making it about you. And the kid will pick up on that and they will have a little bit of hatred towards you in some capacity and they will resent you. And so for anybody listening, like when you're on the baseball field, soccer field, or you're pushing your kid for college, like don't make it about you, make it about your kid and what they want and how you can support them. It's the same thing in sales. If you go and pitch and pitch and sell and sell, you're not going to be as effective as if you actually help someone discover what's possible and enroll them in what you can do to help them. And that's it. Right. Right. So in the beginning, uh, I, I got out of college. I didn't want to go to college. My dad was like, you need to go to college. Like you got to have this piece of paper. Society says so, whatever. And every day I just, I hated that organized learning on their terms. I, I hated that. But you know, he said, look, I'm paying for it. So just go have a good time. Don't get straight A's. Don't spend too much time studying. Like I want you to have a well-rounded education in terms of social as well. And then I got out of college and my dream was always to just work for my dad. And that sounds like a cool guy. He's uh... <laughs> my dad's a great guy. Yep. Nailed, yep. Nailed and I so far in the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and he, um, yeah, he's always been very supportive of me and he's always given me a very long leash to go yeah. out. But the, at, if, if I hit the leash end and I crossed the line, like there was hell to pay, but he was very lenient with me and he let me be me. And that's the, that was a huge lesson in there as far as me as a parent too. I'm sure my dad did shit that I don't like. I'm sure every kid has stuff their parents don't like, or they don't agree with. But, um, my dad was definitely very pivotal and crucial in my development as a, as a defiant person and someone that just wants to carve their own path and figure it out for themselves. You know, it's going to be harder, but I'm, I'm a lot happier figuring things out, and getting to be creative. So I joined my dad in business and started making some serious money in my early 20s into my mid 20s and helped my dad grow his business. And I had a lot of fun and we worked together and, and we, we grew the business. And then 08, we all know what happened. If you're too young, go look at what happened. And it was a very challenging time. And I started to realize that uh, there was something missing here and it wasn't like spending money on another piece of technology or another software or another forklift for the warehouse or another truck. It was that like nobody was working on them and I didn't get it at that point, but I saw that as something missing and um, company, no one was working on them. What's that? You mean in the company? No one was working on themselves. Or- yeah. I mean, yeah. Cause that was my ecosystem and I didn't, you know, I knew my dad listened to Tony Robbins tapes when I was a kid because they were always the, the big like plastic binder of, of cassette tapes was sitting on his car seat all the time and he always put them in. So I had that, I guess, unconsciously when I grew up. And I think that the, the thing that I do with my kids is uh, or with my daughter, because she's five, my son's one is I, I tell them about the personal development, the ways that I'm I'm experiencing challenge in my life and how I get through it. So I I want them to have that context, you know, that middle ground of this is why I'm listening to this audio book, or this is why I'm listening to this podcast. And by the way, for anybody that wants to hear my dad's story, I feature my dad on the podcast like once a month. So 
you know, the one in uh, March 2021 that I release is like, is my dad talking about starting his business and his fears and his insecurities and himself and taking chances and risks. So it's a, it's a neat one, but um, cool. Yeah, dude, he, he, uh, he, you know, basically between 08 and 12, like the business was not doing well. And, and I, I didn't know how to help anymore because I, all I was doing is just living at the office. I literally, I lived in the warehouse for about a year and a half, uh, showered in the sink. Like my wife and I, we or, or my, she was my girlfriend at the time. Our first date was in the office, like in the conference room. And, and it was, you know, it was kind of rough, but I, all I was doing was chasing my fear and insecurity with money. And I thought that the more money I could make, the more I could, I could push that off. It would never solve it, but I could always push it off. And so when I got a 10,000 or $50,000 check, like I knew that I didn't have to be scared for a little bit of time. And, and I, that was a very, very wrong way of doing things. Very wrong. Uh, not wrong. Just not serving, not serving at all. Um, in terms of my growth as a human. And so subsequently the, the women that I was dating, although many awesome women, I just wasn't the right guy. I wasn't the guy that could actually support anybody emotionally or just be there for them as a person. I, I really lacked a lot of uh, compassion and I was really selfish with my time because I was so scared that like somebody could knock me off my pedestal. And if they did, like I was so afraid of who I was without the money, without the toys and the cars and the beach house and the watches and without that stuff, like I'd be lost. And, and I think one of my biggest fears was I, I don't want to be in the middle. I don't want to be in the crowd. I don't want to be some random person somewhere. I want to be special. And the money made me, feel special because my friends weren't making that kind of money. They didn't have the type of toys that I had. Mm -hmm. And then in 2010, 11, like all that shit went away and I was broken and lost. And, you know, the girls that I was dating, I was dating to solve you, something. Uh, me. You lost money or, or what happened? What, how, how did uh, you I lost away? everything, everything, real estate, money, all my money. I, I made a really good amount of money. What's up? How'd you lose it? Um, keeping the business afloot and was it like, spending. Was it like a spillover from 2008 and it just took a, a while to, to... Yeah. Okay. So 2008 yeah. started the, the problem and then by 2010, 11, it started to really unravel. Yeah, but dude, that wasn't the problem. The problem was my financial literacy. And my education oh, around you money. Just, yeah. You were just spending and blowing money or what, what was going on? Yeah. 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 I was, I mean, I, I think at one time my dad and I had probably 20 cars and, and, you know, we we're flying all over the world and, and building businesses and, and buying, you know, luxury items and watches and, and purses for my girlfriends at the time and my mom and like, just uh, we were I think my dad was living vicariously through me he was giving me a life and a lifestyle that he never had growing up in a you know very low income household you know most of his life and his mom passed away when he was 11 so he was you know he had a lot of of, of pain around that that he never dealt with and um so yeah by 2012 I was broken pennies to my name um, I couldn't move back into the condo that I owned because I couldn't afford to live there. So I kept the renter in, uh, nobody would rent to me because my credit was so shot and I was so leveraged out that nobody would rent to me. So I, I just, I kept living in the warehouse and, and in all honesty, like my parents' relationship was too toxic. And so I just didn't want to be in that environment. So I just kind of bounced around from like friends' couches and, and, um, and look, don't, don't take a, it's not a sob story. Like I, I wasn't homeless, but I was making a choice at that time to not be in the environment where my mom would just wasn't understanding what my dad was doing. She was very insecure with money. My dad's a very, you know, risk averse or, or very high risk tolerance guy. And he was like, we'll fix it. We'll find it. We'll figure it out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was just a weird roller coaster of a time. And so the girls that I was dating at that time, just, I, I was dating them to fill a void. And you and I talked about that when I interviewed you on my podcast, which was 
you know, you, you really need to do the work on yourself to figure out, you know, who you are going into a relationship, what value you add, what you need from another person or what you can, what you can get from them to fill a little bit more, but not fill you completely up. Right. You just, most, most people get into a relationship because they're lonely or because they don't want to be the only one that doesn't have a, a significant other or whatever. And that was me. And all my friends were married. I was like 27, 28, 29. And so I was just in relationships to be in relationships for, you know, the camaraderie and the sex and the person to call at night when I was scared and, you know, all that stuff. And I couldn't make relationships ever, last at all. Did you, did you ever go through a phase um, where you were like either a player or did you ever like want to go through that phase, but you were, you know, struggling or did you have, or were you more just focused on, on money most of the time? And that stuff kind of came second nature. You know, yeah, dude, uh, mom, don't listen to this, but yeah, I, I went through a pretty heavy, heavy time of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very just running with a lot of insecurity, trying to find some kind of strength I had and to talk to women was, was a little bit higher level strength than anything else I had. And to be able to, to, you know, get girls to say yes to a date or to, uh, you know, one night stands or something like that. Yeah, it was, it was, I think that was, a, unfortunately that was like a game that I played with myself. Like I, I, I it wasn't purposeful and whatsoever. That, that, that just came you never, you never had any like struggles um, with girls. It was more of just like the, you know, kind of figured out at a young age sort of thing. Uh, I mean, I did inside, I mean, externally, like all of us, you know, you look on Facebook and everybody looks amazing. Everything looks great, but you know, you don't see the other 9,000 seconds or minutes or, or days that they're miserable. You know, you see the one good of post. Of course. Um, I, guess, I guess to clarify, it's my, it's more about not necessarily like having women figured out, but at least having getting laid figured out. Cause that's what yeah, I got that figured out. Yeah, because that's, that's something that a lot of guys struggle, um, something I struggled with horribly for a long time, which is kind of why I started this whole business. It was just like sure. <laughs> you know, figuring out a way to, to get that need met, you know, that sexual need sure. met was like, you know, that just did not come second nature at all. Um, it wasn't for me, dude. It, yeah. it wasn't for me. I just, I kind of faked it until I made it. Like I, I was so scared inside that I didn't know what I was doing or that I'd be bad or that, you know, I like, dude, I, I thought about so many things like on the outside, I walked through the hallways of my college, like nothing, like nothing was wrong. But inside I was, I was terrified of somebody finding out that I was a fraud. And I, I think I got laid to prove to other people. And I, you know, dated girls to prove to other people that I was, that I could do whatever I want, like not whatever I wanted. But if I said that I was going after, you know, this chick, I, I, that I would go and make sure that happened. And I was smooth. Like my, 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 my conversation was smooth. Now, something that you and I talked about on my show was I still thought about that stuff. Like, I even said to you, like, if I were single today, I don't know how I'd do it. Like, I, I, I worry about, you know, back then I worried about what people were going to think or say back to me or like, what would I be able to, to carry a conversation on? Like, I just wanted to get later. I just wanted to take this person to dinner. And, um, and I think what actually helped me was really, really close girl friends that I had um, that. I just never, I never would get physical with them. They wanted to, but I, I really loved having them and to talk to them and to be able to run, you know, challenges with other women by them. Cause I trusted them. And, and I, that was really helpful, but all, through it all, I had this vision of my, of, from my life. I had no idea how I was going to make it happen, but I had this vision for my life that was, I was going to be really successful, really successful. And so I, you know, back then I don't do vision boards anymore. I do live like vision quests, like where I go out and I drive the car, I get on that boat or I tour that house or whatever it's going to be. Back then I had a little vision board that I kept kind of a secret with yachts and ch private jets. And I read Rob Report and DuPont Registry. And I had those out. My, my friends would always be like, what are, you, what are you reading this for? Like you're in school in Northeast Pennsylvania. You think you're actually going to get shit like that? And I was like, yeah, 
you know, I am. And the more they doubted it, the more it pushed me to like navigate very quickly through my own struggles. And it took me a quite amount of good amount of time, but getting laid was not really an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I, I made one of those vision boards too. And, um, <laughs> it's surprising how much of that shit actually comes true. Those things work. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. They work. I mean, I'm not a huge proponent of a vision board. I think you should label like you, if you want to do a, a vision cast for the a vision board leaves it at 2d and you, you, I, I always tell people when I'm coaching somebody like to go after something that they want, they got to feel it, touch it, smell it, taste it, be around it, hear it, everything. Like they've got to know what it's like to have that thing. So if you want that car, go test drive that car. If you can't build up the courage to go test drive the car, then how the hell do you think you're going to get that car one day if you're not actually working on you, right? Like you got to work on you. You got to clear the shit out that's not working in you. It's stopping you from going to test drive a, a Range Rover or a Bentley or something like that. And that in itself is an exercise in clearing or, or at least illuminating and identifying what's holding you back. And I, I found that to be very helpful, really helpful. I mean, as a college kid, I was going and driving uh, Range Rovers and Beamers and Mercedes Benz every weekend. And I walked in there like yeah. terrified. They're going to find me out. I'm only 19. But my dad and my uncle Steve always taught me was you never judge a book ever because you never know one where they're coming from and who's support or, or who's supporting them, like who's backing them up. And so I always had that attitude and I'd walk into a BMW dealership and say, I want to test drive a seven series. And they'd be like, what? Why? And they go, because that's the next car I want to buy. And they would let me and then I would go back and I would remember how the steering wheel felt and how the seat moved and how the car picked up the speed. And then when I got out of college, like I bought a seven series used from an auction, but that was it. And then I just, I would go out and I would, I do the same thing. I called it a vision quest. And I wanted, I wanted to know, and I still use that stuff today. Like my wife and I just uh, drove some cars this, this past weekend on our date night because we're vision questing for the next level of our goals, you know? That's cool. I love that. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm going to go test drive some cars. I, mean, <laughs> I, need, I need a new car soon Dude, anyway. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just look for what comes up when you're like, all right, I really want that Tesla, but I've got two grand in the bank and there's no way I could buy it. That disconnection between who you are and who you want to be, that's where the work is. Because I think people grab random business books or random personal development seminars, but they don't have a focus and a vision on what they actually need to work on. So right. you want to push yourself, go, go, go test drive a car. That's $200,000. And I guarantee you, you won't even go, you won't even, you won't even drive to the dealership. Most people won't even drive to the dealership. And if you do, most people won't get out. And if you do, most people won't say that that's the car they want to drive. And when you can work yourself through that, you will grow, you will break some things within you and you'll get to figure out those things using the personal development strategies or that book that you read or that seminar it just gets you dialed in faster and, it, and it's, and it's more sustainable over time. For sure. Yeah, no, that's great. Cause totally right. You, you know, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many opportunities to, to chicken out there. And if you can, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe you need to go four times before you actually drive the car, but at least each totally. time you go, you're getting a little bit closer. You're pushing yourself more and more. I love that. So, uh, so what, what happened after the, uh, you know, that, that series where you lost, you lost everything. How'd you kind of p pick yourself up and piece it back together and continue yeah. on? Yeah, I, ta I tangent it for a second there. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, dude, I, I, I was pretty lost and I've been a, a professional swimmer, not professional, but like I've been, I've been swimming almost at a professional level my whole, whole life up until that point. And, I realized that like I was going to leave my dad's business. And so I had a conversation with my dad. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do is tell him that I got to move on. And like, dude, it was so emotional for me and I didn't want to show him that emotion. So like, I think it was like May 12th, 2012. I just, I, I had a conversation and I left and I was lost. I no, you know, no girlfriend, no money, live, you know, living in, I had actually gotten my, uh, my condo back at that point just trying to figure out like how the hell was I going to sustain this? And so I started teaching swimming lessons for 10 bucks an hour in May of 2012. 
because it was my mastery and I needed to play in that mastery because I, I had no confidence in myself. I was, it was done. It was gone. I wasn't talking to women. I mean, I was, I was in, on eHarmony and I was, I was getting laid, but that was it. Like it was just to satisfy a, an urge. And, um, I couldn't maintain a relationship. I couldn't maintain anything for more than a week or two. I was just broken and I needed to find me. And so I started teaching swimming lessons and I kept trying to date and kept trying to date and like nothing worked out. And I remember this chick broke up with me at the end of uh, June. She was awesome. Really awesome chick. And um, uh, I, I thought it, I called my dad and I'm like, dad, I, I remember I was sitting in the warehouse and I called him like, I don't know. I can't do this. Like, I, I don't know why nobody likes me. Nobody wants to be with me. And he was like, cause it, it's you, it's, it's not them. It's you take it all on you. And when you make no excuses in any, what anybody else said or is doing, and you take every bit of responsibility on you, you'll change because you'll see it. But the more you blame others and the more you say, well, that chick was this or that guy was that or, you know, my boss did that or my mom does that, you're just placing blame and you're, you're delaying the inevitable. And so I just started to take it all on. And on July 3rd, 2000, um, July 3rd. Oh, sorry. That was no, dude, I'm, 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 I'm mixed up in this thing. So go back to 2009. I'm dating. I'm, I'm just, I cannot maintain relationships. Like I'm just, everything is just pure chaos in my life. Yeah. That was June of 2010. And I, my parents called me. They're like, Hey, you, let's go to this, this kid's birthday party. It's your friends. You know, they moved to Australia and it's your friends. Like, let's go see the daughter's five. And I show up and I'm like, pushing back, pushing back. And then I show up there and I see this girl and I'm like, wow, she's awesome. And I, I knew her cause I met her on July 3rd, 2005 when this little baby was born, the baby who's, you know, now she's five years old and we're celebrating her birthday. And, um, something was different. Something just was different about her. And it was, she was not impressed by me. She really care. She was into me, but she didn't care. She just was like, cool, yeah, if you want to go out, I'd, I'd like to. If, if not, it's totally fine. Like, whatever. I was trying to be smooth. I was trying to work lines. She wasn't having any of that shit. She was yeah. so calm and steady and just the girls I'd been dating, there were a lot of great girls, a lot of duds, but they were all type A, hard drivers like me. I thought I wanted that for this, like, power couple. Mm -hmm. But when I met Meredith July 3rd, 2010, I was like, this is it. It just seems so simple. It seems too simple. It seems too easy. Yeah. And we went out on our first date and we talked for like five hours and I'm like, I got to see you again. And then we went on a second date and I was like, Oh my God, I'm getting some traction here. Like, but I actually like this person. And then, you know, we just, we kept dating and, and, uh, dated, you know, I was obviously working for my dad and like dated and dated and dated. And then about nine months later, I was like, sitting in my, in my warehouse with my dad. And he's like, you know, you're gonna, you need to, you need to lock that girl down. Like she's, she's great for you. And she's a great person and she's going to make a great partner and a great mom and a great wife. And I was like, you're right. He goes, and I said, but Ed, I'm broke. Like I don't have any money. And he said, well, you got a bunch of shit in the back that you can sell. Why don't you go sell it and buy her a ring? And I, 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 I didn't always follow my dad's advice, but I did on that one. So I pawned off basically everything I had, including a boat that I had, um, I had restored and, and she had helped me rebuild. And, um, and so I sold that and actually had a ring from a previous engagement that I went to my jeweler and I said to him, I, I think I found the one and I need a, I need a ring. And he was like, how much money do you have? And I said, well, I, I got this big chunk of money. It was like $45,000 from selling everything that I owned. And he, and I, he was like, all right, well, what, you know, how much cash on hand other than that? And I was like 1500 bucks. He was like, yeah, okay, well, let me show you what 1500 bucks looks like. And dude, this is, this is important for your listeners. At that moment, I said, I can go with where I can go and buy the ring that signifies where I am today. Or I can go and buy, I can put all this shit down on me and bet on me. And I can buy the ring that shows us where we're going. 
And like, don't take that lightly. That was a very hard decision for me. Yeah. And I talked to my dad about my dad's been my, like my sensei, man. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it. And, uh, and I said to my dad, what do you think I should do? And I told him my plan. And he said, if there's one thing you bet on in this life, it's yourself. If you can't bet on you, nobody will bet on you and you'll be broke forever. But if you lay that bet down and you see that big ass diamond on her finger, you'll have a guide to know where you need to go. And I think you should put it all down on you. So I, I put it all down on me, like literally roulette. I laid it all on one number, all on red. And what does that mean? The ring was I, 46.5 G's. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't put all that down. I didn't put all that down. Um, I didn't, I didn't buy with all that money, but I, I, uh, I just, I paid some other, some like lower debts off, pay my car off. Like I just needed to get out of some other debts. Yeah. But it was, it was almost that much. And my jeweler, when I told him that story and the diamond guy was, there was one night, both of them were like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and, I said, <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, you know what though? What if I'm right? What if it works? I love that. That's a dumbest thing <laughs> <laughs> and dude, but the insecurity hit, and, and they're, they're both money off it too. And then like you're fucking. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a family jeweler, so he right. knew me. Okay. Oh my god. He said, um, and he said, "Look, I've been dealing with your family for a long time. Um, I think it's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. <laughs> but I, I, I actually, I actually see this look in your eye. Like you, you can, I want to see what it looks like if you make this happen." And, and so the insecurity instantly went from, fuck, am I making a huge crucial error in judgment? And then he go, and then he, and then he, he righted the ship by saying, I want to see, I, I am actually very curious. Like I've never had anybody say that to me. I've never had someone like have that confidence in themselves. And I didn't have that confidence in me. I just knew where I wanted to go. And I knew that ring would guide me. And I knew this girl was it. She was perfect for me. And, um, and so he said, look, if it doesn't work out, you can always just pawn the ring and get the cash. And I thought, <laughs> dude, <laughs> I got no, I got, I got, I'm all, I'm all upside here. I got, I got no way to lose. Let's go. Let's do it. Book it, do it. So it's, it's interesting because people today uh, see my wife's ring and they're like, I thought you were dead broke when you got engaged and married. And I was like, we were. And then I told them that story. They're like, God, that's ballsy. And I say, yeah, it was, it was really, it was really ballsy, but I'm telling you, I did not want to look at this little speck on her finger. One, she deserved more than that. And I was really upset with myself that I couldn't get her what she deserved. And she never asked for any, she never asked for any of that stuff. And I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to look at that ring and, and show where I was in this Valley, right? I called it the millionaire Valley. And, um, so I had to bet on me and, I also like just for your listeners, I, I knew she was the right one because I built a dating profile. I, I build dating profiles for everything today, still for cars, for businesses, for people I'm going to hire. Um, and I built this dating profile of exactly what I was looking for. And she checked all the boxes, all mm -hmm. of them. And I, I just and I was confident knowing that that was it. Well, one thing that's uh, I've heard quite a few times from guys who are really happy in their relationship is what you said earlier about how it was just so easy. And I can't tell you how many guys come to me with these stories about how this, you know, that they're madly in love with some girl who's not really reciprocating the love and they're trying to figure out how they can get her and, and scheming and plotting and they want my advice and this and that. And I'm always like, dude, like, you can, I can give you all the advice in the world. You can probably get that girl, but it's probably going to be a shitty relationship because if it's this hard, you know, she could be avoidant. You've got codependency issues. There's all sorts of shit going, going wrong. It's almost always the same yeah. story. Guy chasing the hell out of a girl, can't seem to get her or wants her back, blah, blah, blah. And it's always, you know, he's the anxious attached one. She's the you know, the avoidant one. And I'm like, all the relationships that I know that work out really well, it was just easy. They both liked each other from the get-go. There was no yeah. drama. 
and it just works. So fucking stop <laughs> with the nonsense. And like, you're, you're a perfect example, example of that. It's like, if it's just not working, like just find someone new. There's someone, you know, around the corner that it could probably work with sure. better. And that's been my, you know, that, that was a huge kind of aha for me too. Cause um, my girlfriend now has just been so amazing, so easy. So just, you know, clean sure. from day one. Um, so I, I loved hearing that from, from me. And then it was it you know, what now you guys got two kids, right? How long you've been married? 10 years in October. Uh-huh. And dude, yeah. it has not been easy because here's the you thing. It's going is, to be, no, no, it's, it's going to be, you're going to know. So like the conquest, I, I've, I've been there many, many times. The conquest like you feel like you've actually earned it or you get into this mode like you were talking about where the guy's like, yes, I can get her and I can prove to her that she can love me. You're going about it all wrong. It's just not going to serve you. And it might not be wrong, but it's just not going to serve you. And, and there's no sustainability in a relationship like that. When, it built, when it's built foundationally off of a chase and a convince and a make and a, like it's just not you're, you're trying to get it. Versus just being in flow with it. I know that sound might sound a little woo woo, but you got to just like, you got to get out of your own way and that the person will show up. The universe will always deliver for you. It always give you green lights when it's supposed to, but it gave me a green light then. And, um, and then when I left my dad's business, like she's the one that believed in me. I didn't. She's the one that, that said to me in, at the end of 2012, after I've been teaching swimming lessons and making like 150 bucks a week, um, you know, every day dude, crying in my goggles, literally, like I, I, I hated myself. I could not believe I was in the position I was in. And she was the one who just kept saying, this is temporary. Like, I, I know you. You, you you'll, you'll figure this out. Like, I don't know what to do for you, but I'm here. Like, I'll figure this out. And just her being there, she didn't have to say anything. Just her being there. And then knowing that she believed in me and who I was, who I was designed to be, just helped me. And at the at the end of uh, like maybe July or August of 2012, I kind of gave up on myself. And I went. I never had a job, and I always told myself that I'd never write a resume. I never wanted a plan B. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I never ever wanted to have a resume. So. I kind of was at a low point and I, dude, I hired a, from my college, I hired a resume writing person and I almost started the process. And my wife was like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> like the moment you give yourself a plan B, you're yeah. going to go that way because it's going to be safer. And then I was like, when I think I should get a job and my buddy offered me a job at a grocery store, stock and bananas and it had benefits. And I was like, I brought her own the application and she, she looks at me and she goes, and if anybody knows my wife who's listening to this, like she's not this kind of person at all. She's very low key, very, very uh, C and S on the disc model. And she mm -hmm. looks at me and she goes, that's not what I signed up for. <laughs> and I said, well, what did you sign up for? And she goes, I love that. That's great. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, marry, I didn't marry a loser. I didn't and marry a middle manager. God damn it. <laughs> bro. And, and listen, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if you, if that's the path you choose, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the path that was designed for me. And I was giving up. And she said, I didn't marry a loser. I didn't, I didn't sign up for that. I married a guy who goes after what he wants. And that's, that's you giving up. And I'm, I, I don't know if I can support that. And I think most guys in that position, that insecure and that just low in life at that point would have been like, well, you don't support me in every, every situation. We're married. You're supposed to highs and lows, sickness and health and rich and poor. You're supposed to like. Dude, what she did for me that day, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sitting in Beverly Hills right now because of her. Like, I, I built businesses because of her. Like, you want, a, you want a good relationship? You want a good partner? Find somebody that supports you no matter what, but also kicks your ass and says to you, like, don't, don't underestimate yourself. Don't go that low, that low route when you know you can go high. Like, that's what she's done for me. I would not be the person I am today without her, period. I'm not dependent on her, but our partnership is that strong. I would not have the businesses. I would not be the coach I am. I wouldn't have the, the stuff, you know what I mean? The kids, the, the opportunity that I've created in my life. I wouldn't have any of that without her. Now, yeah, on the surface, it looks like I'm the guy that drives. 
but I can only drive because she clears the path. And that is dead fucking accurate. And sometimes she doesn't believe that. But if she didn't take care of the household and the kids and the operations of our business and run our money and clear the path for me to just do what I do best, I wouldn't be who I am or where I am today, period. And I'll bet everything on that. And so over the years, like first year in real estate. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I heard a stat recently that guys in a healthy relationship make 25% more money. Um, You know, they're just way more content. Uh, You know, I mean, I had a, like, I don't know what to call it. Sometimes I call it an amazing run or a hell of a time, but you know, I certainly got the most out of my, my bachelor period, if you want to call yeah. it. That. Um, but I blew a lot of money on dumb shit. I mean, I was having fun. And I think every guy, if they feel like they need to do that, they should. Um, yeah. But at the same time, like if I just look back on all the, the money I wasted, um, oh, dude. chasing whatever. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I think yeah. you have to do that. Yeah. It's almost a um, it's almost a rite of passage. I think you kind of have to do that. You got to start to calibrate and dial in in some capacity. What you like, what you don't like, what you should buy, what you shouldn't buy. Right. But, dude, after our after my first year in real estate by myself, uh-huh. I made a lot of money. I, I had a lot of success because I was just starving. I was chasing after that money. That money solved problems for me. Again, I went right back into that mode. Money solves problems. Let's go. Money makes you feel more secure. It chases fear away. Your anxiety is not going to be there when you get that big check. And then after the first year, I started a team. She, I brought her on as the admin. No choice, by the way. It was, this is what you're going to do. And I was an asshole. She used to call me a terrorist. And I don't know how the hell she stayed with me, dude. No joke. Like the guy I am today is not that guy from back then. It's, it's, I'm t- she used to call me a terrorist. She would say like, I'm just, I hate coming to the office with you. I hate being around you. It's all about business and money. And, and you're missing something. You're like missing something by 2012 or 2016. Uh, the marriage was pretty much over. And it was, we're starting to talk about divorce. Our daughter was one. And Dude, one day working together. Yeah. Still working together. Yeah. No, I mean, and, you, the problems were being caused by that mainly you think. No, the problems were being caused by me because I, I, I was so afraid that someone was going to cost me that next sale. And that money was, I was so dependent on that money for my identity that I, I was, I was an asshole to anybody that would dare get in my way, including her. And that's the huge, huge, um, huge regret of my or resentment of my life is that I, I was like that. However, what she said to me in December of 2016 was, you know, I don't know what else I can do for you. Like, I think this is over. I think we need to move on from this marriage, from this relationship, unless you can figure something out here with you, but it's not the business, it's you. And I remember the, the, the way that she broke me. And I know some guys are going to be like, oh, fuck that. I'll let my woman break me. No, dude, just vul- get vulnerable, get real vulnerable, get, get open and clear with your, with, your, with your spouse or your partner. And I guarantee you some magic that happens. And she said to me, are you really the model of a man that you want your daughter to potentially attract in her life one day, if that's what she chooses. And dude, I fucking lost it. I emotionally, I lost it. I couldn't stay up on that power, you know, stance anymore. And I said, no, I'm not. I know I need to change. It's like, I'm just afraid of who's going to be on the other side. Like, am I going to be as powerful as a sales guy? And am I, am I going to be a business, you know, still powerful business owner? Will I still be able to make a lot of money if I'm what I thought was weaker or more sensitive or more soft. And so I just, I immersed myself in more and more personal development, but I, I had a focus and and I had this idea again, going back to who do I want to be my purpose? I understood who I wanted to be. And I chased after that. And I used the tools and the exercises to find that guy within me. And I, I give this analogy all the time. Michelangelo's David was, it's like a 15 foot masterpiece carved out of solid marble, right? And when Michelangelo was quoted, uh, allegedly, somebody said, how did you create this? And he said, I didn't. I just, I just chipped off the pieces of marble that weren't David. And that's the same shit for us is that we, we through society and, 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 our, and our just flawed school system and mom and dad and traumas, we 
get these pieces of marble on that aren't us. And we walk around like that's us, but we're miserable inside. And all you got to do is not pile more shit on. You got to take more shit off. And that is where vulnerability and honesty with yourself and breaking yourself down a little bit comes in and you start to shed the marble and the real you actually emerges. It's just there. It's been there. And when that happened, like our marriage got solid, our businesses really took off and we were able to start more businesses and just start to help more people with their relationships and our coaching business took off. And like, it is all because of that partner challenging me to be the best version of me possible without her even saying it, you know, and like I, I'm forever and I don't want to say indebted because that's our obligation to each other is to push us to be the best we can be. But I, if it wasn't for her, I, I wouldn't be who I am today, period. Yeah, no, it sounds like she, she pushed at the right times. And I like when she told you basically like, no, I didn't marry some, you know, <laughs> some schmuck who <laughs> builds a resume. Not that there's anything wrong with having a resume. No. I mean, I think there's, I think entrepreneurial is more of a personality type than it is a, anything else. Um, I heard this from a, from a guy who actually teaches the, the kind of, and, and He's like, being an entrepreneur is, is not like, it's, it's either kind of like you are or you're not sort of thing. And I'm like, yeah, I guess that's true because the thought of like making a resume just makes me like, oh my God, fuck that. You know? <laughs> like, I would rather, <laughs> I'd rather be a bum on the street and like be my own fucking boss than, yeah. uh, than work for anyone. And, you know, some people are really happy to work. For me. I, I sometimes I wish like, you know. <laughs> back in the day like but it would be so much yeah. easier if i could just get a job and like not have to worry check. about this or that other. yeah consistent check but yeah. it's also my idea of personal health so <laughs> my too, dude i i was so scared of being locked down to like this one building in this one parking lot in this one cubicle and this guy who tells me what i can and can't do when i can and can't go and like that that for me was a limitation on my potential and yeah. yeah, there's, there's like, there's a lot of companies that have offered me some really serious money, but once that mission's dialed in really tight, you can say no to things. Like I had someone offer me a seven figure position sales, like sales leader for a very large company last year. And I said, listen, man, I'm going to stop you right there. Like, I really appreciate it. I'm like flattered by this, but it's a, it's a no, it's a very confident no. And the guy's like, are you out of your mind? It's a lot of money. And I said, yeah, but you're going to make me go to an office every day. You're going to keep me in Baltimore. You're going to keep me away from my kids. And that you're going to tell me I have to come in by nine or eight 30. And like, I don't do that. So no, you could offer me 10 million. It's a no. Yeah. Cause my mission is so yeah. solid. Yeah. 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 No, it's crazy. That's, uh, that's a inspiring story. And, um, you know, to be able to come back from that and yeah, it just goes to show, you know, that, you find the right relationship or you do the right work on yourself, yep. you know, you kind of bounce back from anything. So, um, oh. dude, thanks so much for coming on and sharing so vulnerably and, you know, talking about a lot of the shit that, you know, you won't hear guys talk about very often. So appreciate that. Yeah. Where can, yeah, where can guys find you? Obviously men on purpose is the podcast. Um, yep. uh, yeah, men I, on purpose podcast on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher, or any of those places, top 1% podcast now in the world. And, um, which I didn't know when you and I were talking like last month, but we're 1% in the world, dude. It's pretty freaking nice. cool. Congrats. Um, thank you. Yeah. It's really, really, it's probably cause I wear this shirt every day of my life and everybody <laughs> sees it. <laughs> no, no, we're doing some good stuff with that podcast. Um, uh, you can find me at, uh, at mentalpurposepodcast.com or my name, Ian Lobos, L O B A S.com. And find everything you need to know. Uh, Frontrunner.group is our live event. And we've got one coming up in, uh, in July in Lake Tahoe. And it's, dude, those events are power packed. But it's all about working on you. Like you have to work on you. You cannot get the girlfriend to think that they're going to change you or the boyfriend. You cannot get the job or the money and think it's going to change you. Like it will perpetuate whatever you're dealing with. It may be a temporary relief, but it's not sustainable. So, you know, work on you. Eliminate all the shit that doesn't work. It's not serving you. And I, I, it's a recipe for success every time. Every time. We've got hundreds of clients around the world, you know, super high level people that have, have, have repaired their marriages and their lives and like took a vacation for the first time in 10 years, like because they've worked on them, you know, made more money, more yeah. success, quit their jobs. Like it's all cool. For sure. Because if you, if you 
even when you get that thing that you're striving for, you're, you're right. It's just a temporary thing because it's just filling a void. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That. Oh, and our dude, our, our, uh, our Facebook community, Men on Purpose, it's, it's not the Men on Purpose podcast community. That's different. It's the Men on Purpose community. And it's a free Facebook community. And for anybody that joins, like I give, I got a bunch of free coaching stuff and, and, and exercises and, and video tutorials and stuff like that guiding you through. Like, I just, I want to be supportive as, as much as I can of the, especially the men of this world to make those changes they need to make. Yeah, guys, go grab that stuff. You can even get a free T-shirt. I think there's some way to do right. that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you hit me up, if you if you go and you you subscribe to the podcast and you give me a five star review, I'll get you a free T-shirt. I, I remember when we we spoke when you interviewed me. I'm gonna start doing that too and give away the uh, fucking PZDX shirts. That uh, yeah, dude. Uh, <laughs> this is the first time I'm announcing it on on the show. So if anyone. You know, message me on whatever social media, whatever hits me up. Give you a fucking piece of DS shirt. Just yeah, you dude, to. you got what you got. Now you got to go print them. Yeah, no, I've got them printed, but uh, <laughs> no one knows what they mean. It, it, it's uh, Russian and English hybrid. It basically means shit happens. But anyway, oh, all right. <laughs> Ian, thanks so much for coming on. And guys, go to the website for more awesome episodes. Download the uh, perfect first date and. Uh, Fucking work on your purpose. Get out there. Make shit happen. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.